One, two, one, two. Okay, so you can hear me. Can you also see something? I hope so, yes. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, when I was told that uh, I will be speaking in the Node Core section, I said, oh, I have nothing to do with Node Core. What I'm going to say? But then I thought, maybe there is some uh, kind of uh, something that I left inside the Node Core. So I went to my computer. I went to my computer. Computer is not listening to me. OK, I will use the button here. It's not listening to this either. OK. Oh, yes. So I went to my computer, good boy, uh, and asked <laughs> it to find me uh, whether I have something in the Node that is related to me. And wow, there is one commit related to me. So <laughs> I guess uh, this commit is what defines me for the purpose of Node Core section. Basically, hello, my name is Mr. Aleph, and I hack. <laughs> Mostly I hacked on VMs in my life. So I've hacked on the Java VM, and then I hacked on V8, and I now hacked on the Dart VM, on all kinds of VMs. And uh, all the VMs, they have something in common, basically performance. Of course, they have some other things in common, like stability, correctness, and so on. But seriously, if your code is running 10 times faster, you can tolerate some crashes, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> so, and uh, that's what I'm going to be talking uh, today about, mostly about performance. I will be mostly ranting about performance and how people measure it, and they do it incorrectly, and so on. <clears throat> and I'm going to use, uh, the, like, to investigate performance, you always need some method. And uh, I'm going to use the method by this guy. So this is not a Node Core comp contributor, though he looks a little bit like Dominic Tarr. <laughs> That's not him. So I initially wanted to leave his name out of the slide and ask who is that. But then I saw Dominic Tarr and I said, uh oh, this is not going to work. <laughs> this is René Descartes, also known as the father of the modern philosophy and uh, also a father of some parts of mathematics. Very important guy. But what he uh, said is doubt everything. That's his method of uh, research, basically. You need to discard everything that you know and then rebuild your beliefs from scratch, investigating everything that you add to, the, to your belief system. And that's what you should use when you encounter performance issues and, or, or you want to understand the performance. But what people use instead is this nice site here. And uh, probably you know this site is called JSPerf. It has Perf performance. OK, it also has JS. Stands for JavaScript, I guess. Uh, and they write benchmarks like that. And when I see that, well, I usually go to this site when I feel that my blood pressure is very low and I'm fainting. And when I go to this site, <laughs> my blood pressure rises and I survive for another, uh, <laughs> for another time, yeah. So. Uh, so if you look, if you go to this benchmark page that I screenshotted here and you scroll down, then you will see results like that. So like, wow. Some people will look at these results and say, the double tilde is the fastest way to parse the string into a number. Yay, I will always use double tilde. But uh, no, dudes, that's not how it works. So uh, that's false. Ah, horrible, horrible idea. Uh, the problem is that our JavaScript VMs, they are kind of clever. Where clever I define as being not dumb. So they're not exactly clever as clever people, but uh, they're not dumb as not like a table, for example. So, uh, and of course, to get some meaningful measurements from your benchmarks, you need to be a little bit smarter than compiler. So basically, on the next like table, compiler, you. So this, this kind of pyramid here. OK. So I, I'm going to show some uh, things that happen with your benchmarks, uh, how a compiler uh, choose them into pieces. But I'm going to show it mostly on the source level, because I decided that it will be easier and faster than explaining, like, there is this thing called phi function, and it is coming from the compiler course. Blah, 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 blah. And, and on the source level, it's easy and faster to understand what's happening. But you should keep in mind that compilers do not operate on the source code uh, level. They use something more sophisticated underneath. OK, so it's kind of a legal disclaimer. So everything that I show you here is kind of not true, but also true. 
try not to have your mind blown at this moment. Okay. So let's start with this benchmark. So basically, that's what GSPerf does with your test case. So there is initialization there, and then it starts the benchmarking loop, and it puts what you put in the test case in the benchmarking loop, and then it returns how much time you spent running this benchmarking loop. It's kind of like that. It's not exactly like that. And uh, the compiler is kind of smart. So of course, what it does, it like says, hey, I can just put it there because it was a constant. Like, it was a constant there. It, nothing changed it. I will just put it there. OK. And then I can evaluate one expression because like application of tilde to the constant, I can fold it. Then I can fold it once again. And wow, we have an assignment of a number to a variable. That's really what we wanted to benchmark. That's, yeah, cool, cool. So this is called constant propagation. It's like majority of compilers do that. So as long as you have, uh, if you're trying to benchmark things applied to constants, basically you're measuring nothing, like assignment of constant to a variable. Uh, here, smart people would say, oh, I can trick the compiler. I will make it not constant anymore. Mm. <laughs> Wrong answer, McFly. <laughs> no, 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 no. So the problem is that it's still an invariant in the loop. So it is not a constant, but it doesn't change in the loop. So the compiler, who is smarter than table, will just uh, put it outside of the loop, compute it once outside of the loop, and assign that value to the variable in the loop. Great. We're still measuring nothing. So this is called loop invariant code motion. And also, all the JavaScript VMs these days do that. It's essential optimization. OK. But they can go even further away. They will say, OK, there is an assignment in the loop. But nobody uses the result of this assignment. And nobody uses the result of that assignment. If we assume that, then nobody uses the value that is assigned. And nobody uses the other value either. So I will just throw this everything out. <laughs> there is nothing left there. Only sound of silence, basically. OK. And if it's a really, really sophisticated compiler, it will say just, OK, why the loop? Why the loop? <laughs> nothing left. OK. You basically have infinitely fast code now. Your tilde operator makes everything infinitely fast. Add more tildes everywhere. OK. <laughs> this is called dead code elimination. That means elimination of a code that is dead, which means not used, basically. OK. Yeah, as I told, uh, most engines won't go as far as eliminating the loop, but like most sophisticated compilers like Java VMs or C++ compilers will do that. So I, I assume that JavaScript VMs will also sooner or later get it. OK, so what you should have understood from the slides that I have shown so far is that Optimizers are your mortal enemies if you want to write micro benchmarks. They will just chew on them and leave nothing but uh, crumbs. And yeah, your results are meaningless. So people would ask me here, how do we make them chew proof? You know, there is chew proof stuff for docs. How can we make chew proof stuff for the compilers who are smarter than docs? So, uh, well, my answer is usually don't just write any micro benchmarks. They are really, really useless. Uh, they're very useful for VM implementers because they can help to understand what's going on inside the VM. But for normal programmers, it's not anymore an era of measuring whether the pipe pipe operator is faster than if statement. The VMs no longer run the source code as like AST3, which they did like in 1964 or whatever. Uh, yeah, so don't write them. But if you really need to write them, you should at least remember four things, like, and uh, I count backwards. I think I programmed too much fourth. So uh, the most important thing is verify results. So if you write the benchmarks, never ever forget to verify results. Because first of all, you need to make sure that you actually wrote code that makes sense, because sometimes people write code that makes no sense. And, uh, and the rest is just to battle the optimizations that compilers implement. So you need to avoid constant expressions. You need to avoid stuff that in the loop will be invariant. If you really want to measure, like repeat the same thing again and again, you need to ensure that it will not be hoisted out of the loop. And you need to avoid that code that will compiler just throw away. But if you verify results, it kind of solves many of these one, two, and three things, because uh, it's not that code, at least, anymore, for example. The, the result is used by verification. Uh, okay, and when you verify, you need to throw so that the compiler can't just throw it away. 
Okay, so, oh, there is a little bit, the size of this font is fine. Okay, you can see the most important things. Uh, so that's uh, a micro benchmark rewritten with my advice. It looks a little bit more complicated now, like there are two values, two strings, and uh, we swap them every time in the loop, so at least it doesn't stay constant, kind of. And we like convert one, and then convert another, and then convert one, convert another, so on. And at the end, we check that it's either that or another one. Though, of course, I could have just said it's an uh, uh, even number of iterations, so I know what will be the result, but I just checked either one or that another. So, okay. And you can notice that I like JavaScript implicit conversions. So I, one is a number, and the other is a string, and I compare them. Oh, great. Okay. So, yeah. It's as good as you can get this benchmark. But still, if your compiler is really sophisticated, so because I worked on the Java VM, I would say, oh, no, no, no. I still can, the JavaScript, Java VM could still defeat that. How? Very easy. Let's take a look at this loop. So there is optimization that says, OK, let's repeat the body of the loop twice, but do twice less iterations. It's, lit it's a little bit differently implemented, so it builds like a control flow differently, but for the purposes of the slides, I just made it this way. So you repeat the body twice, and you do twice less iterations. And uh, when you did that, you can propagate the values inside the uh, loop body, and you do swap twice. If you swap twice, what does it mean? You did not swap anything. <laughs> so the compiler can remove that, then like, you, we have two dead assignments because like, the value of j is overwritten and the value of t is not used anymore. And there is, again, the loop invariant. So th again, we are measuring nothing because the, then it will hoist the loop invariant out and the loop is empty, the sound of silence. And yeah, and we can all listen to Simon and Garfunkel. Yeah, so okay. This optimization is called loop unrolling. And uh, like C++ compilers, Java compilers, they do that. Okay. But VM, V8, for example, does not do it right now. Uh, but I want to induce you some paranoia when you write microbenchmarks. <laughs> OK, so uh, what else? OK, here's another benchmark. AngularJS references this benchmark as a reason for uh, them choosing some pattern in their code. And uh, if you look at the results of this uh, benchmark, you will see something like that, like Chrome 29. And Chrome 32, <laughs> like super fast. So what people usually say here is like, oh, good work, V8 team. You sped up the function calls very fast. So uh, let's go back. So that's uh, the last case where you just apply function to the list of arguments without any apply call or anything, just invoke the function with the fixed arguments. And the function just do a concatenation of its arguments. OK, so they say very good speed up for function calls. Some people also say that it's a kind of magic. <laughs> but uh, if you have listened to the previous stuff that I was telling and were not sleeping after lunch, then you know that this is all wrong. This is not what actually happens. But I must be honest, when I was making the slides yesterday, the stuff that I was thinking was happening wasn't actually happening, and it took me a while to figure it out. So yeah, I had to be honest with you, otherwise I would be embarrassed. OK, so let's. Uh, Let's think what actually should happen here. That's what I did before. Like, try to evaluate it in the mind. Uh, so we have this application of a function there. And uh, we are smarter than a table or a dog. So we say, oh, why, yes, sir. I know what are we calling here. It's up right up there. So let's just take that stuff up there and put it down there. And that's it. There is no call. There is a concatenation of what? Four constant strings. And it is out. So we are now running super fast because we are running the empty loop. Success. This is called inlining. And it looked very simple, but wh why was the difference? Like, did we teach Chrome 32 to inline better than Chrome 29 did? I didn't recall anything, so I was something is very spooky going on here. So I wrote the uh, like standalone. Can you read it? Yes, uh, I, I can read it at least. So uh, I wrote this very uh, simple micro benchmark that I could run in the shell, like it's basically the same that JSPerf does on the on the browser side. I wanted to run it in the shell to understand what's going on. 
So um, I download it like benchmark.js from GitHub and load dash on which it depends and so on. You can see that it's uh, Mr. Dalton who is doing that because it depends on node dash. So, uh, okay. Uh, and then I run it with two V8 versions in the shell, like I build this shell, and really one was like super slow and the other one was like super fast. I was like, okay, we have a trouble here. Houston, we have a trouble. So then I invoke some real hardcore magic. There, like all these magical flags, which you can find on the internet if you know where to look. And, uh, and then I put the result of all this stuff into this tool that I wrote, which I wrote in Dart. Dart is better than JavaScript. I had to say that, sorry. Uh, uh, you can go and to this uh, site, and you can, it, it runs in the browser, and you can uh, like load files that you collect locally and inspect them. It looks like this. I can show you how it looks. Yeah, it looks like this, basically. It's the tool, and it has all the instructions how to use it with V8 or Dart VM. It was originally written for Dart VM, but I also extended it to work with V8. So, okay. So I put it in there, and then I looked at the block that's like in the... Uh, oh, I ran out of time. But anyways, I looked at the block that's in the body of the loop, and really, there is nothing left. You can see down there where it says tech check go to, that's the, basically the... Uh, native code that will be generated. That's a low-level re representation used by the compiler. And there is nothing there in the body of the loop. There is emptiness. So it really eliminated. So why the difference? Well, so it was optimized correctly, as I would expect it to be optimized. Uh, not at all. The, the body of the loop was optimized right, but when I looked outside of the body on the entrance, there was a de-optimization. So uh, not to go into much details here, what happened is that compiler optimized code and then tried to switch to it, and then it imme immediately de-optimized. So, and uh, because it tried to convert non-number to an integer, and uh, it tried to convert it again and again, like it tried to recompile, but it was again making this wrong decision, uh, thinking that something is an integer while it wasn't an integer. And it was just basically never succeeding in uh, applying the optimization, never succeeding in to switch into optimized code. Yeah, so what happened is that it thought that this date there was uh, an integer for whatever reason. There was a bug, basically. And uh, it was trying to convert it to an integer, which was a wrong, wrong decision. So, but it was fixed in the newer version of uh, V8, and uh, that's why the Chrome 32 shows big improvement, and uh, Chrome 29 was not showing any improvement. Okay, magic demystified. Okay, in truth, there are more traps here that I showed. Like, for example, if you take this benchmark again, and you run it twice, this function, then the first one it will run in two milliseconds, and the second time it will run in 37 milliseconds. The most appropriate thing to say here is that, like, yeah. So this is, I'm leaving as an exercise for the reader. Uh, all compiler books, they have exercises for the reader because they are used in the university. And this is like compiler 101 in the JavaScript conference, so there should be some exercises for the reader. Uh, it's related to how V8 understands what to inline and how to guard the inline stuff. And uh, if you go to my blog, there is a URL down there. There is enough information there to understand why it happens. And there are links to the bugs that, uh, when they're fixed, will fix this behavior. It is not visible on gsperf because gsperf generates new copies of the functions via the new function constructor invocation. So they are disconnected. So each run is a separate run. But if you run it twice, you get a different result. OK. So my biggest advice here is that you should not uh, try to write micro benchmarks uh, because it requires Diligence, uh, well, everybody has diligence. Uh, I don't know, it requires something, nobody knows what. So uh, uh, just try to use big, meaningful stuff. So actually, on JSPerf, you sometimes see meaningful stuff in there, like let's try to apply Angular JS template to the Ember something and pff, measure how much iterations uh, does this thing does. Oh, usually one iteration, but OK, a lot of information. OK. so. Uh, for example, I found once this uh, benchmark, which is people were competing like, given a string of space-separated words, find the most common word in this string. So how do you do that? Well, the first attempt is very simple. You split the string into spa by spaces, 
and then you just run this like split words, you take each word, and then you count them. You have this dictionary of, you use an object as a dictionary, you put stuff in, like if it's the first time you encounter it, you put one there, if it's the second time you increment the count, and then if it's bigger, you keep the max on the site, and then you update the max if you, if you found the new, new, new maximum, like one. Yeah, very simple. Basically, that's what you do in the school in the second grade, kind of, these days. Uh, maybe third, I'm not sure. Okay, so if I put this into, again, in the shell version of JSPerf into benchmark.js, it will do a, on a 1.5 megabyte string and it will do 13 uh, iterations per second, which is okay. I have nothing to compare, so maybe it's good, maybe it's bad, who knows. Can we do a little bit better? Let's look again at the, what happens inside the compiler there. So when it loads, it lo does a dictionary load. It says load kit generic. It's basically a dictionary load, which V8 knows nothing about. And when you update the dictionary every time, like for every word, you update the, the value there. It's a generic store to the dictionary. And generic load and generic store, they're disconnected. But in fact, they're always updating the same cell in the hash table, essentially. So that's where the, the redundancy is hiding. So in C++, you would just take the pointer to the cell and update the cell. That's how it works in C++, like STL, STD map, whatever. So you can emulate this in JavaScript. That's the first idea you get. You just, instead of storing the count, you store like an object that contains a count. And then you don't have to, uh, to update the count, you don't have to store into the dictionary, you just update the, the value in the cell. So you have the pointer to the cell and you update the, uh, the value in the cell. Very simple. And it allows to eliminate one dictionary store that was hiding in the else branch. Uh, and it's a like, good improvement, so almost a factor of two, not enough for a factor of two, maybe 30%, uh, 50%, I don't know. Yeah, so not enough. Maybe we can do much better. Let's really think about where is the redundancy hiding here. Uh, well, the redundancy is really in that we first split into pieces and then we iterate over the pieces. You have to allocate all these substrings, you have to like iterate the string once, you have to allocate substrings for each word and so on. You have to allocate array for the result. That's a lot of allocations here. GC takes like 24% of the whole execution time. And instead we can be like, it's a node core. I now remembered, I'm speaking in the node core section. I forgot for the previous 25 minutes. Uh, the stream is an answer to everything in Node. So we can also stream char by char into a tree. This is not a misspelling, as might, some might think, oh, this Russian guy doesn't know how to spell tree. That's a real data structure. You can read the, you know, on the Wikipedia about this. It's basically like a tree where each node is connected. Like if you get one character, you get to the node, and then if you, are, if you get the next character, you get to the second node, which signifies the concatenation of these two characters. So on. They also note like as radix, prefix trees, and so on. Very, very useful data structure. So you can you can switch to a different algorithm for this. Instead of splitting this into pieces, you can just run it character by character and build a tree on the site. I'm not going to go into details. I just run over it. So, for example, here's how you handle a character. You just take the current node and ask it, what's the next node for the current character? If it's not defined, then you create a node, uh, and if it's defined, you just use it. And for the space, you check the, you increment the value on the current node, and you check if it's a new maximum. And instead of like taking a substring right away, you just remember where the word started and ended, not to do substrings again and again. So, uh, yeah, and this is like very good improvement, like almost a factor of well, factor of five almost. So. Uh, by rethinking the algorithms, usually you can achieve more than by changing if oper statement to the pipe operator, which just drives me nuts when people do that, because it destroys the readability and everything. Basically, algorithms one-on-one. -on -one. That's a very important talk for the next LXJS, I think. Uh, yeah, so put the algorithm first, macro benchmarks for the operations last. So almost thank you. Last thing I want to say is uh, that uh, People also try to assume, or tend to assume, that uh, certain language features are slow because they are slow. Like they've measured something, and it, it runs slow. And they say, oh, it's, it's slow. It's, it's 
like the God intended it to be slow. It's this way, and it, you're fighting against Zeus if you try to make it fast. So don't do that, please. I beg you. Uh, talk to the people who actually work on JS engines, or any engines. Uh, I don't know. Talk to the guy who makes a Steam engine run. I don't know. That's uh, yeah. And uh, file bugs if you see something run slow, like if you see function prototype dot bind is slow, array prototype for each is slow. Just tell them on the bugs. So thank you and see you in the bug trackers of V8, I guess. <laughs>